we're talking about who do you think you are? You're a whosoever, you're chosen of God, you're somebody, you're a child of God, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, you have the mind of Christ, you have the wisdom of God, in all matters of wisdom and understanding and science and languages, you're ten times better. Yeah. Ten times better. Look at someone and say, ten times better. Now, this isn't so that you can lord it over each other. You know, Joseph in the Old Testament made that mistake. He made the mistake of thinking that the dream that God gave him was so that he could be a big shot. He had a dream that everybody was bowing down to him, so he went and he shared it with his brothers. He said, hey, guys, I've had a dream. It's so cool. You all came and bowed down to me. It was awesome. What do you think? They said, let's kill him. And they were going to kill him, but instead they sold him as a slave. And uh, eventually he ended up being one of the highest leaders in Egypt. And his brothers came. And he didn't go strutting in there saying, look what I became. His dream that God gave him was so that he could help his family. He brought his family in. They were able to have food. There was a famine in their land. So they came down and they dwelt in that land. And he was able to save his family's lives. That's what the dream was about. See, the dream God gave you isn't so that you could be a big shot. The dream God gave you is so that you could save your generation. That's what it's about. It's not so that you can be cool. You know, some of you have dreams of being musicians and being up in front of people and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's great, but realize what the dream is for. Because otherwise, you'll end up on the wrong end of the thing, and the devil will try and rip you off. Well, you, you don't need to let the devil rip you off. You need to be on top of things. Amen? Amen. I want you on top. I want you to win. I want you to be successful at everything you put your hand to do in life. I mean, I want everything you touch to turn to gold. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, you go through life, you, you go to college, you get straight A's. Or, you know, you go to high school and you get a scholarship so that you can go to college for free. You go to college and you just ace the thing, you know? Why? Because of the mind of Christ, the wisdom of God, the ability of God that's in you. Not because you're so cool, you know? I mean, the only reason you're so cool is because Jesus lives inside of you. If Jesus didn't live inside of you, you know? If he didn't live inside of you, it wouldn't be cool at all. You'd be a dork noodle. That's what you would be. But he lives in you. He made you alive, you know? And we're finding out who we are. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places, man. We're, we're up there. We're right up there at the top, man. It's awesome. It's awesome being at the top. See? And you don't have to carry around the, all the responsibility of it because all you have to do is listen to him and do what he says. Ephesians chapter 2, we've looked at the first, what, 10 verses of this already, but we're going to continue on with verse 11. And we're going to find out a couple of more things tonight of what you're not. Sometimes it's really important for you to find out who you are. You have to find out who you're not. So let's look at this starting in verse 11. It says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, <laughs> everyone say, but now. Yeah. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What does Christ mean? The anointed one and the anointing. Now, you need to realize that it means both. And you can't separate the two. You know, Jesus, you can't separate him from the anointing. He is the anointed one. He is the anointing. So when you're talking about it, uh, you're talking about it one and the same thing. It's not just his anointing upon your life. Because with his anointing upon your life, that means he's on your life. And if he's on your life, then the same anointing that's on him is on you too. Now, that's good news. Because you have that, Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do also, and greater works than these shall you do. Now let me ask you a question. I'm, I'm going to get the microphone here. Is this one still on? Yep. Still on. 
I want to find out. I want you to think for just a minute, and then I'm going to come out there. I want you to think for just a minute. What would you like to see happen as a result of Jesus being in you? Would you like to see lame people walking? Blind people seeing? No, I'm talking about one thing. What is the one thing that you personally would like to have happen? You'd like to see it happen. I mean, there's just something burning in your heart. I'll tell you what mine is. All right? Mine is I would like to see mentally retarded people restored, bam, just like that. You know? They're there. You pray for them. You know, maybe, uh, maybe there's some very obvious evidences like Down syndrome or something like that. And you can tell just by the look on their face and their eyes and stuff that they have it. But you lay hands on them and they're transformed instantly by the power of God. That's mine. That's what I want to see, you know? That's what I get excited about. I, th I think about that. I, I meditate on that. I, I spend time just envisioning that happen in my ministry. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And I'm really excited about it. So I want to find out from you for just a second. I'm coming down here. We got a hand here. Hayden, there you are again. What would you like to see? Seeing nations come to Christ. Nations. A whole nation, like all at the same time? Uh, heaps of nature, nations at the same time. That'd be cool. How about you? I'd like to see all the wealthy people that live in sin turn to the Lord. Wouldn't that be me? Just bam, just right in their face. How about you? I'd like to see people raised from the dead. Raised from the dead. <laughs> Let's go to the graveyard, shall we? We'll dig somebody up and see what happens. How about you? I'd like to see all divorced marriages come back together again. Divorced marriages and broken marriages. I'm sorry, come back again. I can't see your foot down there. She kicked me, but I'm healed. Okay, how about you? I'd like to see all India saved. All of India. Who's got a nation on your heart that you'd like to see saved? What's the nation you want to see saved? India? Who wants to see India saved? Wouldn't that be cool? How about you? We got a hand here. I want to see America. You want to see America? <laughs> what, like Disney World or what? I want to see Disney World saved. While I'm there, riding on the rides. Ah, ah. How about you? What would you like to see? Let's see all Israel become Christians. The uh, Jewish people, Israel, to become Christians. Wouldn't that be cool? Jesus showed up. Excuse me. Excuse me. Pardon me. Excuse me. Pardon me. What are you doing on the floor? <laughs> She's having a rest. How you doing down there? Here she is under the chair. We're going to hear from under the chair right now. What would you like to see? Probably the daylight, right? Um, the street kids in China um, all get into homes. Street kids in? China. China? Right? To all have homes? That's pr there's probably, what, a billion of them, right? You okay? All right. We'll look forward to you coming back and joining us, okay? Some people just have that anointing to get down where people are, you know? How about you? What would you like to see? A sinless world. A what? A sinless world? You know what? There's a new heaven and a new earth, and God's going to bring it down. No sin, no devil, no crud. I mean, check this out. No laundry, because there won't be any dirt. You know, you can't get dirty. Isn't that cool? How about you? Well, I would like to see um, the reporter in the, on the news say that there was the, word, the world is just perfect this day. The world become perfect. Amen. We'll do a couple of more. We'll do you. All the gangs in Australia and all the big groups of evil people and stuff like that start preaching to each other. Oh, that'd be awesome. Just gangs getting saved and going around getting other gangs saved. How about you? I'd like to see Jesus come back. You'd like to see Jesus come back. How about you? Did you raise your hand? Did you raise your hand? Oh. Um, I knew there was another hand over here. Um, I'd like to see all these Christians to actually just to be able to get serious with God and not have to worry about what other people are talking about and think of them. I like that one. That one's awesome. That is very cool. Give them all a big hand. Isn't that awesome? For all the Christians to get serious about God and start acting like Christians, how many of you think we ought to do that? Well, I've got, 
I've got desires, and you have desires, to see some things happen, okay? And we're going to see those things happen. Jesus said, the works that I do, greater works shall you do, because I am in you, and I go to the Father, I send the Holy Ghost. And we've got the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of us. We're going to do greater things. You know, I don't think they'll necessarily be greater in quality, because the things that Jesus did were awesome. But I think they probably will be much greater in quantity because when he went to heaven, poured out his Holy Spirit on people on this planet, they all started acting like Jesus and miracles started happening through all of their lives and it multiplied it. It wasn't just one person, the Son of God, causing miracles and, and uh, things like that to happen. It was multiple thousands of people walking around healing people from the from sickness and disease, raising people from the dead. I tell you what, I want to see some people raised from the dead. You know? We're, we're going to see that happen. A friend of mine was over in Russia, and he was there as a missionary, and they were in a service one night, and one of the ushers uh, died in the service, had a heart attack. So they dragged him out of the meeting, and he was out there in the hall, and they laid him up on a bench, and this friend of mine went over and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command life to come back into you. And the guy sat up. <laughs> Tell you, we shouldn't be losing ushers during church, you know. We've got to keep those guys around. Amen. Verse 11 again. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Here's something you're not. You're not an outcast. The Gentiles were outcasts. They weren't part of the promise of God. There probably aren't any Jewish young people in here. Is there anyone who's Jewish in here by descent? Scream if you are. Got a couple of screaming Jews. Okay. If we were still under that original arrangement only those people who just screamed could be saved and nobody else in this room that would have been pretty bad how many of you are glad that you can be saved amen so you're not an outcast anymore see the Jews would treat other people like an outcast because they weren't the seed of Abraham and God's instructions to the Jews were very specific. He said, you know, don't marry anyone outside of this group. You know, just stay within your group. Why? Because those other people were worshiping idols and all kinds of ungodly things. And if they got together with those other people, you know, you see uh, Solomon's life. David's instructions to Solomon in the book of Proverbs are very specific he said, don't give your strength to women who go after other idols and stuff. But Solomon, he didn't listen too good. He had 300 wives and 700 girlfriends. They called them concubines. But when you see that word concubines, that means ladies who are reserved and available for him. So he had like a thousand women. He was a very busy guy. And uh, most of them worshipped idols. And they drew his heart away from God. So God's instructions were very specific to the Jews. And so they were supposed to stay away from Gentiles because they ended up getting in trouble when they hung around those Gentiles. But now we're not outcasts anymore. Praise God. I'm not an outcast. You know what it feels like when you know, all, all your friends are together in a clique, in a group, and you can't get in? Isn't that a bummer? I mean, they're all together and they're like, Wow, you know, we've got all these things. They've got a little club. And you'd really like to be a part of it. But they won't let you in. Let me tell you something. Clicks, clicks, little groups of people who have little things in common don't have to be bad. They can be good if they're open clicks. If they're closed and nobody else can get in, then they hurt people. But if they're open and somebody new comes in and they say, hey, there's somebody who likes the same things we do, then all of a sudden you just da -da 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 -da, you get them and they get in and they're part of something. See? 
Now, in the States, public schools are very big. Most of the time, private schools and Christian schools are pretty small. So in the public school system, there's lots of cliques. I mean, you walk in and you just pick one, you know? I mean, they're, they're, the schools are so huge that uh, there's this group that's all into sports. There's this group that's all cheerleaders. There's this group who's all into computers. There's this group who's all into picking their nose. There's this group who's, you know, into something else. And you can walk in and check it out. And you find your group and you get involved with that group. And, uh, you know, pick your nose. But anyways, <laughs> he found his group. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He's excited. <laughs> But a lot of times in Christian schools or, or private schools, uh, they're much smaller, so the groups, the clinks are much smaller. And the way that it turns out many times is you might end up being the only person in your group, which is really frustrating, you know? Because, like, you know, you're into computers, you have a pocket protector, you have this side thing, you know, that you hold your computer in, carry your phone, your beeper. I mean, you look like RoboCop, you know, you've got all this electronic stuff all over the place. And you're the only one. You have a lot in common with yourself. And that's about it. Well, that isn't any fun. You say to your group, come on, let's go. And off you go. <laughs> By yourself. It gets lonely sometimes. You know, you go to a Christian private school and, and you're the only cheerleader. Standing on the sidelines, okay, here we go, here we go, ha, 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 ha. come on, everybody cheer, and then you're all by yourself, just, all by, just cheering by yourself. It'd be really hard. There you are at your private school, and you're the only one on the football team. You pass, and then you go out and catch it, you know, block for yourself. It's rough. Of course, you have Aussie rules and all of that kind of stuff over here. You know, you just put it on the ground and, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. That's wild looking stuff. I've seen some of that on TV. That's wild looking stuff. But wouldn't it be bad if you were the only one on your rugby team? That'd be pretty serious. What's worse than that is wanting to be in a group and not being able to. Can you imagine the numbers of people who looked on the Jews and saw God blessing them and doing miracles for them, opening up the Red Sea for them, cloud by day, fire by night. I mean, just all kinds of miracles. And people looking in there and saying, man, I wish I could serve that God. But they couldn't. They couldn't get in. But Jesus came. <laughs> but now, look at someone say, but now, you are in Christ. See, you're not an outcast. You are not an outcast. So if you begin feeling like an outcast, that's not what you are. If your Christian friends turn their back on you and you feel like an outcast, know this. Jesus will never turn his back on you. He never will. I'll tell you how I know that. He can't. Why? He promised he would never leave you and he would never forsake you. Isn't that awesome? He won't. He won't and he can't because he promised. And it didn't, you know, if you blow it, if you do something wrong, don't run away from him. Run to him. Why? Because you're not an outcast anymore. Here's something else you're not. Number two, you are not without the anointed one, and you are not without his anointing. This is in verse 12. It says that at that time you were without Christ. You are not without anointing. This is so awesome. Whatever situation you face, whatever thing that is right there in front of you, you have everything it takes on the inside of you to handle it, to deal with it, to take care of it. All God's power, all of God's resources, all of God's ability is on your side. You are not without anointing. You're not. 
How many of you feel like you're shy, timid, like get embarrassed easy? Okay, let me tell you something. When it comes time for you to get up in church and give a testimony, let's say this next Sunday, after this whole week of the Spirit of God moving in your life and good things happening to you, let's say that on church on Sunday your pastor gets up and says, some of our young people went to the Believers Convention and they got all fired up for the Lord and we're going to have one of them give a testimony. And you're thinking, well, I'm shy. No, you ought to get up there and you ought to know that when you stand up there and open your mouth, that the anointing, the ability of God will be there to testify. How many of you know who Benny Hinn is? You know who he is? Incredible man of God. I was reading this book that he wrote called The Anointing. And I was reading about how he used to be as a teenager. He was a young man uh, growing up. I think they were growing up in England or something. They moved to Canada. Uh, I'm really not sure where they were before Canada, but I think it was England. But he got to Canada. He was in Toronto. And this young man, Benny Hinn, as a teenager, he stuttered so bad he could not finish a sentence. He couldn't talk. If, if he had to talk in front of somebody, he couldn't do it. He could not finish a sentence. He would you know, get all jammed up with his words, and he couldn't speak. He went to a Catherine Kuhlman meeting. Catherine Kuhlman was an incredible woman of God. Tremendous miracles happened through her ministry. And he went to one of her meetings, and he just sat there in amazement felt the Spirit of God like he'd never felt before, saw the miracles occurring all around him. And Catherine Kuhlman got up and she said, these miracles, this anointing, could happen in any minister's life if he would only pay the price. And what she was talking about is spending time with God. Well, Benny Hinn was shy and didn't like to talk to people because he stuttered so bad so he decided he was going to pay the price. So for a year, he spent most of his time, it's just almost all of his spare time, in his room at home, praying, fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, talking to God. He was filled with the Spirit. He spoke with other tongues. So he spent lots of time praying in the Spirit. And he was out there in his room getting drunk in the Holy Ghost by himself, having the Spirit of God manifest itself in his room in a thick presence. He would fall out under the power by himself in his room. He would just have tremendous experiences with God for a whole year by himself. He was the only one in his clique. After that year, God gave him an incredible vision of the ministry God wanted him to do and things that God wanted to do in the earth, he went and shared it with a pastor. And a past, this pastor said, you've got to share this with my church. Well, that terrified Benny Hinn. He couldn't believe someone was asking him to come share this with his church. But he decided that that's what God wanted him to do because God had been dealing with him about being a preacher. But he could not in his mind imagine himself getting up in front of a crowd of people and preaching. He couldn't picture that in his brain. All he could picture is himself stuttering. So he decided he was going to go to this church. So he went and he's sitting there in the front row. And the pastor gets up, talks a little bit about this young man. He was like 17 years old or something at this time. Talked about this young man who had this vision he brought the young man up. He said, come on, come up to the front and tell the people your vision. He was scared to death, man. I mean, he was just like shaking. And he was walking up there and he got up behind the pulpit. He didn't have any idea what he was going to do. He thought he'd open his mouth and just start stuttering. He was scared. He got up behind there and he began to open his mouth and the words started coming, man. Just one right after the other. He didn't stutter anymore. He just spoke to those people. He shared his vision. People started falling out into the aisles. People started weeping openly, loudly, right in the middle of his talk. He's talking to them the same things that had happened to him 
by himself in his bedroom began happening to this church that he was talking to. First time he ever got up in front of anybody and spoke. And ever since then, I mean, you know the rest of the story. I mean, he's got a great church in Orlando, Florida, and the Spirit of God is moving. He's doing crusades all over the world. The power of God moves in his meetings. Why? Because he paid a price. He didn't just stop there either. He still fellowships with God and spends much time in prayer. But he paid the price. You are not without the anointing available to you. Who wants more anointing? You know, check this out. There isn't any such thing as kind of pregnant. Have you ever thought about that? You know, here's a lady, she's out to there. Someone comes up and says, are you pregnant? She goes, well, kind of. They go, well, is there a baby in there? Yeah. Well, then you're pregnant. Well, sort of. What do you mean sort of? You're either pregnant or you're not. See? I mean, that's a baby in there. Well, it's the same way. You have the anointing of the Most High God inside of you. That anointing can do anything. Now, you don't determine everything that anointing does. The Holy Spirit directs how that anointing works through you. But you can spend so much time with the Holy Spirit that the anointing can flow freely. Now, that's some of what we're talking about. See, if you don't realize who you are, you might be holding back the anointing. You don't want to do that, do you? Go, no. You don't want to hold back the anointing. You want the anointing to flow freely from you. You want to be walking down the street and you bump into someone and they get healed. Or you want to be walking down the street and your shadow hits somebody and they get raised from the dead. You know? That's, that's how much anointing you want flowing through you. There was a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth, earlier on in this century. He died, I don't know, 1940s or 1950s or something like that. Tremendous man of God. But this, this, this man of God, he, growing up, he never learned how to read. Later on he learned how to read, but all he read was the Bible. Never read a newspaper. All he read was the Bible. He was a rough man, but God got a hold of him and changed him. And he was so in love with God. He was so on fire for Jesus. I mean, the power of God was on his life in such a powerful way. But he would do things that would upset people. Now, the religious mind gets upset at certain things. That's why we need to get rid of our religious mind, because it holds back the anointing. When Jesus showed up on the scene, his hometown did not receive the anointing on him because in their mind, he was this little guy who grew up with them. And their thinking held back the anointing. Now, you don't want to do that, do you? Go, no, no, not going to do that. Not going to hold back the anointing. I read a story about Smith Wigglesworth. One time he was praying for sick people and there was a woman, she had a growth on her neck about the size of a cantaloupe. And she came up to the stage and he went to pray for her. Now, you've got to understand, Smith Wigglesworth had an intense hatred for sickness and disease. He couldn't stand to see people suffer because of what the devil had done to them. He hated it with a passion. He couldn't stand it. When he saw people with sickness and disease, he didn't go, oh, you poor thing. You blessed woman who has suffered so much. No, he attacked it. He got this woman up on the stage, and they had been praying for a number of people, but he got her up. Here's this big old thing on her neck, you know, with veins popping out, just gross looking, yellowy, greenish looking thing awful. How horrible for the devil to mar this woman this way. Well, it made Smith Wigglesworth mad in the spirit, you know, like this zeal that Jesus had. They brought the woman up there, and he just started yelling, man. He grabbed the woman, took his fist, and started pounding on that thing. 
He said, come off in the name of Jesus. Come off of her. Come off of her. Come off of her. Come off of her. In Jesus' name. And the woman is screaming and crying. Ow, 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 ow. She's freaking out. Well, he's, he does that, and then he sets her down over there on the stage, and he goes to the next person. She's still sitting there like, oh, oh. Well, the pastors who had come to the meeting are sitting there, and they're getting ticked. I mean, they're getting so mad. They're sitting there going, how oh, dare he beat that woman that way? Oh, I can't believe And one of the pastors was just getting ready to get up, go up to the platform, stop the meeting, and kick this awful man out for beating on this poor woman. And just when he was ready to get up and go stop the meeting, Smith Wigglesworth stopped, turned to the woman, and said to that growth, I told you to get off of her in Jesus' name. And the thing went, pew, and disappeared. Not a mark. Well, the pastor never got up, <laughs> of course. You know, he's like, oh, I am so mad. And Smith Wigglesworth did that. And it went down. Everyone, oh, praise God, she's healed. You know, their religious thinking changed. But see how religious thinking can keep you from the anointing? You know? I mean, God might want to have you do something that nobody's ever done before. You know? But in your mind, you're thinking, oh, no, I couldn't do that. I mean, if you came up in a prayer line to Smith Wigglesworth, and he says, what do you need prayer for? You say, I have a stomach ache. He might punch you in the stomach. Because he hated sin, and he would attack it. Now, the people he did that to, he was led by the Spirit of God, and they got healed. One time, he, he got uh, called to a home, and this man was dead. He raised, I don't know, eight or ten dead people in his ministry. He went to this home, and this man was laying there dead. And they said, we want you to pray for him. So he went over there. <laughs> I mean, if you can picture this, all right? He went over, he grabbed the dead guy, picked him up, threw him against the wall, and said, walk in the name of Jesus. The man hit the wall, the dead guy, hit the wall and fell down on the floor dead. <laughs> Everyone's standing there going, uh, 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 uh. Well, Smith wasn't a quitter. He picked the dead guy up again, <laughs> threw him against the wall, bam, said, walk in the name of Jesus. <laughs> fell down dead. Nothing. Well, let's try this again. He picked the dead guy up again, <laughs> threw him against the wall, and said, walk in the name of Jesus. Bam, and the guy started walking. <laughs> you would too. <laughs> oh, that's cool stuff, man. That is so cool. One time Smith Wigglesworth was on a trip, and this was, you know, later on in his life. And while he was gone, his wife died. He came home. They said, your wife has, has died. She has passed away while you were gone. Where is she? She's up in her room. Okay. See, back then, they didn't, you know, rush you to the morgue and drain you, you know, and do all that stuff. They left you there for a little while. I, you know, so people could come and see you or something. I don't know. But anyway, so he says, where is she? She's up in her room. So he went up to her room. He knelt down next to the bed, and he says, I command life to come back into you right now in Jesus' name. Boink! She said her words. This is his wife. Smith, what are you doing? He said, well, honey, I don't want to go on in the ministry without you. Isn't that sweet? Everyone go, aww. He said, I don't want to go on in the ministry without you. You're my wife. You're my homemate. She goes, Smith, 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 Smith. She's just raised from the dead, you know. 
She goes, I've seen Jesus. She goes, it's time for me to go. I need to go. Will you please let me go? <laughs> this is what she said. She said, Jesus told me that he has more for you to do, but it's my time to go. He said, well, okay. She said, will you let me go? He said, yeah, go on. And she, she died. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> you know, he'd have probably, you know, if he'd have forgot to, to tell her something, he'd have probably brought her back again, you know. <laughs> By the way, I meant to tell you. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You are not without anointing. You have all of God's anointing on the inside of you to deal with every situation that you will ever face. Isn't that cool? Look at someone and say, that is so cool. All right, number three. Number three. Number three. You are not an alien. <laughs> You're not an alien. You're not the weird one. Sometimes people look at you at your school like you're, like you're the weird one, you know? You're sitting there in class, and the teacher's going on, and the teacher says, no test today, and you go, praise God! And they go, praise what? You, go, you know, God, like the guy who made you? Hello? What, do you think you came from a monkey? You? Maybe. Me? Uh-uh. And they think you're the weird one. You know what? You're not. You're not an alien. <laughs> they are. <laughs> They're the weird ones. Yeah, we're a peculiar people, but we're peculiar because we're different from them. And the difference is we have God on the inside of us. That's the difference. Now, we don't, remember, we don't have God on the inside of us so that we can be a big shot and lord it over people. We have God on the inside of us so that we can help others. And whatever the need might be, whether it be a dead guy that needs to be thrown against the wall, or a lady with a growth out to here, you've got anointing on the inside of you, and you belong, man. You're not an alien. You're not from, a, you know, from some strange place. You're from heaven. The spirit that's in you is from heaven. You're a citizen from heaven. Number four, you're not a stranger. Uh, you're not strangers. This is cool. This says, and strangers from the covenants of promise. You're not a stranger to the promise. You are part of the promise, man. You've got the promise himself living on the inside of you. He was the promised Messiah, and now he lives in you. That is so cool. You're not separate from him. You're together with him. You know, when you pray, you don't have to yell. You know why? He's closer to you than your face. How close is your face? That's pretty close. Well, he's closer than that. He's in you. I mean, you know, how close is your liver? Uh, you can't get any closer than that. He lives on the inside of you. You're not a stranger to the promises of God. The Bible talks about Jesus being the Word. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were created by Him. Who's Him? Jesus. He is the Word. And when He lives inside of you, the Word, the covenants of promise, live inside of you. That's why you need to renew your mind to the Word, because when the Word and the Holy Spirit, they get together, things happen. In the beginning of time, in Genesis, the Spirit of God was moving over the waters. And when God spoke the Word, the Word and the Spirit came together and creation happened. Now the same thing happens in your life. You get full of God's Word, you get full of God's Spirit, the two come together and it creates a life full of good stuff. Who wants some good stuff? Amen. You are not a stranger. Number five. Uh, the last part of verse 12 says, Have, having no hope and without God in the world. You are not hopeless. You have a hope. Now what is hope? Hope is, hope is a lot like goals. Okay? You set goals for your life. What's your goal? I mean, a goal would be, what do you want to be? So what's your goal for your life? Your hope 
is that thing you set yourself toward. This young man over here, when he says what he would like to see is Jesus coming back. I believe we're going to see him come back. You know, in our lifetime. See, I'm not looking forward to like dying and getting buried and having worms crawl through me and stuff like that, you know. And then having to get resurrected there, you know. The Bible is very specific about this. It says, we that are alive and remain... You know, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will be caught up together with them, will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Well, that's cool. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought what it would be like if you're close to a graveyard when the rapture occurs? Because the dead in Christ will rise first. They'll rise first. And then we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So if you're walking by a graveyard when the rapture occurs, you're walking by... And the trumpet sounds, and all of a sudden, people start flying out of the ground. It's going to be cool. It's not going to be like, oh. They're going to be changed. They're going to have a new resurrected body. Resurrected bodies are cool. Jesus had a resurrected body when he showed up with his disciples. They were in a locked room, and Jesus appeared. Poof. Hello. They're like, Gah. Where'd you come from? He said, they said, oh, it's a ghost. He says, I'm not a ghost. Here, give me something to eat. I'll show you I'm not a ghost. Here, touch me. I'm not a ghost. And then he talked to him, gave him some instructions, and he said, see ya, and went, and he was gone. Now that's cool. You can walk through walls and still eat. I want one of these resurrected bodies. And I'm going to get one. So if you're walking by a graveyard when the trumpet sounds, People come flying up out of the grave, sod, dirt everywhere, you know. And then you change. <laughs> Resurrected body, brand new, very cool, heavenly kind of stuff. And then, because you'll have a resurrected body, you're going to fly. Just going to... And just take off, meet Jesus in the air. You'll be around your friends. Man, wouldn't that be cool if it happened like while we're having convention here? You hear the trumpet sound, and you go, race ya. <laughs> now the Bible talks about that being our hope. That is our hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is what's going to get us there. All right? But that's our hope. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we're aiming at. Jesus is coming back. My hope is Jesus. That's what I'm aiming at. I don't aim at riches. I don't aim at fame. I don't aim at, you know, being popular. I don't aim at just, you know, being a good guy and just being nice to people. I aim at Jesus. He's my aim. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He did the same thing. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. We are not without hope. We've got a direction. We're going someplace. And it won't be long. And we're going there. All right, so you're not without hope. You're not hopeless. And you're not without God. We are not a godless people. We have God. Now, I was in uh, fifth grade, uh, probably about, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. My, I have an older brother. His name is Steve. He's a pastor in Minnesota. And he's a big guy. He's bigger than me. He's always been bigger than me. And uh, when I was in fifth grade, he was in sixth grade, I was out there on the playground one day. And this bully comes along. And he's picking on me. And he's pushing me around. He's calling me names and all this stuff. And I was a little guy. And I didn't know what to do. And he's just shoving me around. I'm saying, leave me alone. He's like, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, well, uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here's my brother who was famous for his headlocks. You know what a headlock is? You get their head and you lock it like that and you squeeze until like they pop. <laughs> all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here's Steve, my big brother. He's on top of this guy pulling his head off. He's got him on the ground. He's going, hey, how do you like that, huh? Hey, hey, how do you like that? Hey, you want to leave him alone or what? guy's turning blue. Well, I thought that was so cool. I'm standing over there. You know, the guy's on the ground. My brother's got him in a headlock. I'm saying, yeah, yeah, this is, don't mess with me, man. Yeah, that'll teach you. And all of a sudden, I was like really tough. 
And I wasn't doing nothing. Well, what was that thing about? I had somebody on my side. Isn't that cool? You've got God on your side. You are not without God. When you stand up in a situation, you are not alone. You are not by yourself. Imagine how Moses felt. He's got three million Jews behind him. Behind them are the Egyptians coming to kill him. And he's standing up there, and there's the Red Sea in front of him. He's not sure what to do. And the Israelites are going, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. And he's saying, watch your confession. Stop it, you guys. <laughs> Ow! Smoke coming out your ears. Well, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever seen birds sitting on a power line? Just sitting there. What if another bird come up and sat next to him and they kissed? <laughs> Kentucky Fried Galah. <laughs> You know, if they knew how much power was going through there, you think they'd sit there? Probably not. Well, you don't have any idea how much power is on the inside of you. It's huge. You are not far off from God, from his anointing, from his power. You are so close. Let me talk to you about Paul for a minute. Paul, uh, in the book of Acts, used to be Saul. When Stephen, the martyr, was killed... Paul was standing at Saul. He was there. He was holding everyone's coats, going, yeah, kill him, hit him again. Yeah, throw another rock at him. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. He was into God's word. He knew it frontwards and backwards. He knew the law. He knew the prophets. He knew the word. But he didn't have any life in him. In fact, he had death in him. And he went from town to town arresting Christians, putting them in prison, awaiting trial so that they could die for being a believer. That was Saul. Now, you know, God doesn't see things the way you and I see them. This guy had disqualified himself from being a Christian so bad. Man, he was a Christian killer. He went around murdering Christians. If you want to do something that doesn't give you much favor with God, that would be it. You know, go around killing Christians. That was his job. That's what he did. He went around putting Christians in prison so they could be put to death. That's what he did. Now, God, talk about God who is rich in mercy for the great love with which he loved us. God looked down and saw this guy. This guy was so mean. He'd break into their houses. Can you imagine you're laying there in bed at night, tonight, and someone breaks into your house and drags you off to prison for being a Christian? That's what Paul used to do. But God looked down from heaven and saw this guy and said, I like him. You know, God didn't look at things the way you and I do. God says, I like him. He's neat. He's nifty. I see potential in that guy. Now, God didn't like him because he killed Christians. God liked him because he was a man of action and he did things. He did something about what he believed, you know? And there's a lot of quality in that. So God said, Jesus, you need to go down and meet this guy. So one day, he's on his way to go arrest some Christians, and Jesus showed up. <laughs> Boink! You know, knocked him down, blinded him. He's laying there, can't see a thing. And Jesus says to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I love what Saul said. He said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> I think he had a clue. What do you think? He had some kind of idea. He's laying there blind, you know, on his back. What the heck is going on here? Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Who? Jesus. He said, go into town, I'm going to send someone to heal you. How do I get there? <laughs> Can't see nothing. So the guys let him into town. And he's three days fasting and praying. You'd fast and pray too, man. 
Ananias. God, speak, God sends an angel to speak to Ananias. Here's this Christian guy in Damascus, and he's praying, and God speaks to him. He says, I want you to go to a certain house, and there's a guy there named Saul, and I want you to lay hands on him and pray for him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias goes, uh, oh, wait a second. Lord, I have a question. Question, question, question. Just have one question. Can I ask you one question? God says, okay, what? He says, uh, is this the same Saul that kills Christians? God says, yeah, that's him. Ananias goes, forgive me for being inquisitive. But let me ask you one more question. One more. Just one more, please. God says, what? He goes, I'm a Christian. He kills Christians. I am one. If I go there, he might kill me. God says, don't worry about it. I've chosen him to preach to Gentiles and kings and Jews and everybody. He's a chosen servant of mine. And Ananias is like, yeah, you could have fooled me. But he obeyed the Lord, man. He just went. He says, all right, man. Jesus wants me to go do this. I'm going to go do it. He went in. He says, Saul, the Lord Jesus Christ who appeared to you heals you. Receive your sight. Boink. His eyeballs open. Wow. I can see. And in the Bible says, immediately. Paul began to preach in the synagogues. Jesus Christ, the anointed one. He was just as zealous for Jesus as he was against him. He had never met him. You know, most people who have a hard time with Jesus never met him. Because if they'd met him, their lives would have been changed. And your life can be changed too. See, you're not far off. You're not an alien. You're not a stranger. You're not without God. You're not without the anointing. You have everything God has for you living on the inside of you. I want everyone to stand up to their feet right now. Stand up to your feet. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're a Christian, you're a believer, you love Jesus, I want you to begin to pray. Just pray right there where you are. There might be some young people in here tonight that don't know Jesus, that are without God, that are without hope, that don't have any direction for their life. You begin to pray, and their lives can change too. I want to ask you this question. We've done this a couple of times already this week, but maybe there's some new people in here. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to. If you don't know Jesus, you're on your way to hell. And hell was not created for you. Hell was created for the devil. You don't have to go there. You can go to heaven with us. Jesus loves you so much, he provided a way for you to get saved. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Christians, be, be praying right now. We bind the spirit of darkness off of any young person here right now that is here. God brought them here. We bind that spirit of darkness off of their eyes and off of their minds so that they can see the salvation of God. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you've never asked Him into your heart before, and you want to ask Him in tonight, you want to say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me of all of my sin. You've never done that before. I want you to raise your hand wherever you are. Raise your hand if that's you. Jesus wants to save your life tonight. Just raise your hand wherever you are if that's you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, if you're here tonight, you're Christian, you love God, but there's things in your life you know are not pleasing to Him, and you want to get right with God tonight. You want to get rid of the sin. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If that's you, you've got something in your life that you know is not right and you want to get forgiveness tonight, I want you to raise your hand wherever you are, okay? 
Bunch of you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't leave this place tonight with sin in your life. Don't leave tonight with things in your life that are wrong, that are keeping you from getting closer to God. Man, you want to be close. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Anyone else? All right, here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand, I want you to make your way down to the front here right now, and we're going to pray. Give them a hand as they come. Come on. Don't even think twice about it. Just move right down here to the front. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Just come on down to the front here. No sin. No sin. No sin. No sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law. You've got Jesus in you. Just come on up. Got a whole bunch of you. Just come close to the stage here. Come on. Come on, close to the stage. Just push in here. We're going to pray a prayer all together. <sighs> you know what's going to happen to you? All that heaviness, all of that stuff you've been carrying around, the, the guilt and condemnation the devil's been trying to ruin your life with, it's going to leave you right now. You want that? And to be free? Oh, such an awesome feeling. No condemnation, no guilt, no shame, nothing. Those of you in the audience, stretch your hand up here toward these that have come. Those of you down front here, just lift up a hand or two to God. He's the one who's going to change your life right now. Say this prayer with me. Everybody in here, say, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. And you shed your blood. You took care of the sin problem so that I could walk free. Free from guilt. Free from condemnation. Free from shame. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of every sin, all that I've done wrong, and things that I haven't done that I was supposed to do. I'm sorry, God. I repent. I turn away from it. No habits are going to have a hold on my life. I declare myself free in the name of Jesus right now. Now thank Him for it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. No more sin. No more sin. No more sin. You are free. You are free. You are free. You are forgiven. I want you to say that. I'm forgiven. I have no sin. Jesus' blood is more powerful than any sin. My sins are gone. As far as the east is from the west, God has removed them from me. No more sin. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. No more sin. You have no sin. None. Now let me tell you what. Let me tell you something. If you go to God tomorrow morning, say, God, remember that thing I did? God's going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. You say, well, God, you know, last week, that, that thing that I did, God's going to say, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Why? God chooses to forget. You ought to do the same thing. As far as God's concerned, you never did it. Isn't that cool? Look at someone and say, I didn't do it. 